I don't have a link for next week. Email friends at tulsalibrary.org to request one. Our program today will be recorded and available later on the Tulsa Library YouTube page. At the end of our program, there will be opportunity for questions and answers. Please type any questions that you have that you would like Phil to answer in the chat box. Our traveler today is Phil Armstrong. Phil is a native of Ohio and has been in Tulsa for 20 plus years. He holds a bachelor's in mass communications from Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Akron. Phil has a varied background working in the corporate sector and as an entrepreneur in the restaurant business. In 2019, he was hired by the Tulsa Community Foundation as project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. Phil has been actively engaged in the community by serving on several nonprofit boards, most notably the Barth Barthamus School for Music, Community Service Council, Reading Partners of Tulsa, and the Greenwood Cultural Center. He is a leadership Tulsa graduate and a member of the Rotary Club of Tulsa. A talented singer, Phil enjoys singing for several events and organizations around Tulsa, most notably singing the national anthem for the Tulsa Regional Chamber Annual Meetings, Tulsa Drillers, and Tulsa Roughnecks Home Games. Please help me welcome Phil Armstrong. Thank you, Marion. It's uh, excellent to be with uh, you all today, and I so appreciate any opportunity um, that we get to um, be an ambassador, not only for Tulsa, but for the work of the Centennial Commission and for this um, exceptional and vibrant history um, as it relates to um, Tulsa and Tulsa's Greenwood and its black citizens and the history of black Americans in Oklahoma. Um, thanks again to Mary Sexton and also want to also acknowledge and um, kudos to the library's chief executive officer, Kim Johnson. I believe under her leadership, the uh, library system has just become a shining example of uh, what can happen when public and private partnership uh, really uh, aids and benefits the citizens of Tulsa. So thank you to Kim Johnson for her leadership. Um, without any further ado, I'll just chime right in and get right into our presentation. The work of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. For those that don't know, this is actually the second state appointed commission. Uh, the first commission, um, bipartisan state appointed commission was in 1997. And it's actually called at that time, um, the commission to study the 1921 Tulsa race riot, as it was referred to then. That commission sunset in 2001. They researched, it is a, a wonderful, um, uh, excellent document, professional uh, document um, that was led by, and that commission was led by State Senator uh, Don Ross, I'm sorry, State Senator Maxine Horner and State Representative Don Ross. Um, Oklahoma historian Bob Blackburn led that commission. That commission actually, at the end, spelled out recommendations for reparations and for the uh, economic destruction that took place, verified the actual claims and insurance amounts, and actually researched the uh, claim of deaths that were associated. It is a very, very conclusive report. This commission, founded in 2015 by State Senator Kevin Matthews, at the time one of the only African Americans serving in the State House here in Oklahoma, uh, is the person that actually got the conversations and dialogue going for a second commission. And our role and our appointment was to study and to research and prepare for um, the 100th centennial, at that time six years away, and what the city, what the state could do as a commission to acknowledge and prepare for the 100th anniversary of this event. So this presentation goes into detail, talks about the History Center that we're building, talk about some of the plans for 2021, but more importantly, to walk you through the history of pre-Greenwood uh, to Greenwood itself, 
to the massacre and the events of the massacre, and then more importantly, what happened after 1921 and where we are today. I'm going to uh, put uh, my presentation on the screen, and you should see here momentarily um, Greenwood Rising, the legacy of Black Wall Street. When I do these presentations, the first thing I like to show is a video. This will be the first three minutes and 38 seconds of HBO Watchmen's um, that debut, uh, Watchmen that debuted on a Sunday night, August the 20th, 2019. Let me set up this video and then we're gonna talk about it um, afterwards. Imagine that you are a fan of the comic book of the Watchmen. Imagine having an HBO subscription wherever you are all over the world. Imagine tuning in and the first three minutes and 38 seconds, this is what you saw. So let's stop there for a moment. I'd like to talk about that video because it was the, the one 
thing that really put the work of the Centennial Commission and this history on a worldwide global scale. Um, within two and a half, almost three weeks after that debut, I spent countless hours uh, on the phone with uh, media agencies all over the United States. Um, and if you name them, I, I, I was having interviews with them and members of the commission, even all as far as the BBC. And the interesting thing is that they would all say the two or ask the two same questions. Um, did I see Watchmen? What do you think about Watchmen? And then they would say, how much of that was Hollywood hype? I mean, planes flying over, shooting from planes and people dropping things, you know, how much of that was Hollywood hype and what part of it was actually real? So then I spend the next 10 to 15 minutes giving them a count by count of what's the eyewitness accounts that are held at the Oklahoma Historical Society from black citizens and white citizens that are on record of planes flying over in the, uh, the early morning hours of June the 1st um, and uh, bullets being uh, um, shot through the neighborhood um, and incendiary devices, what they were referred to as kerosene bombs dropped on rooftops of buildings and homes um, and then all the other incidents. And I said, you know, this was probably the most real video depiction of what it must have been like in the midst of the massacre of 1921. Then they would always say the second thing and they all say the same thing. Um, if this really happened this way, how come nobody knows about it. Therein lies the crux of the situation um, where our work, the Centennial Commission's work has been in enlightenment and in education about what took place, not only in 1921, but to talk about this vibrant enclave of African-American exceptionalism in the early 18, late 1880s, 90s, on into the 1900s and beyond called Greenwood. So um, the other things I'm gonna talk about as far as that video is, and I'll share my screen once again and get back to uh, the presentation is, uh, so a couple of things from that video, the woman, the mother that was playing the piano in the video, um, the place that she was in was an homage to the Lula Williams Dreamland Theater. Uh, it was destroyed in 1921, never rebuilt. The Lula Williams Dreamland Theater was a state-of-the-art theater in Greenwood. Black citizens and white citizens would come to the Dreamland Theater. Uh, it boasted of the only theater in the state with air conditioning, whatever air conditioning must have been back in 1921, but it was a state-of-the-art arts facility um, in Greenwood and again destroyed. The uh, first portion of that video, um, the silent black and white film, was an homage to Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves was the first black deputy U.S. Marshal, served west of the Mississippi River. His territory was Oklahoma and Arkansas. He is one of the most famous U.S. deputy marshals that ever lived. Brought 3,000 felons to justice, only had to kill 14 people. He was known for being very crafty, um, disguising himself and surprising his uh, villains and bringing them to justice. The life, the real story of Bath Reeves is the inspiration for the Lone Ranger, hence the black mask on his face. If you go to Arkansas, there is a large 20 foot statue to the life of Bass Reeves. And you can see here, Reeves is the subject of the season two, episode four of Gunslingers, The Real Lone Ranger. And I'm sure some of you now have a wrinkle in your brain, as I call it, when you've learned something new. How many of you knew that Bass Reeves was the real life inspiration to the mythical character or the storybook character of Lone Ranger? So I'd like to talk about those two to get us started. Tulsa's historic Greenwood District reflects the power of the human spirit generally the vision, determination, and resilience. That's the key word through all of that we're doing. The remarkable resilience of its oppressed and marginalized black citizens specifically. Hannibal Johnson is the foremost authority on all history relating to uh, Black Wall Street and Greenwood. 
Um, he has just released his 11th book on, 10th book on this history, but this book he wrote actually almost 20 years ago, Black Wall Street. It is the most referenced and resourced book utilized on this history. And there is a letter in this book, a real letter between two individuals called Oliver and Curtis that I would like to read to you that he included in his book. Dear Oliver, I am, by our local newspaper, fully advised of the whole terrible tragedy there. Now that they have destroyed your homes, wrecked your schools, churches, and business places, and killed your people, I am sure that the Negroes will rapidly give up the town and move north. Enclosed, please find drafts for $40 to purchase your ticket to Detroit. We'll be expecting you, Curtis. And his reply, dear Curtis, how kind of you to volunteer your sympathetic assistance. It is just like you to be helpful to others in time of stress like this. True it is, we are facing a terrible situation. It is equally true that they have destroyed our homes. They have wrecked our schools. They have reduced our churches to ashes and they have murdered our people, Curtis, but they have not touched our spirit. And while I speak only for myself, let it be said that I came here and built my fortune with that spirit. I shall reconstruct it here with that spirit and I expect to live on and die here with it, Oliver. And it is with that spirit that we build Greenwood Rising, the Black Wall Street History Center that is under construction even as we are on this Zoom call, an 11,000 square foot facility that will tell the narrative history and story of this community long before uh, statehood, long before the Oklahoma land run of 1889, the historic all black towns of Oklahoma, the massacre, the events that led after the massacre and where we are today. It's being built at the corner of Greenwood and Archer, the historic gateway to what was Black Wall Street. Here is a few more renderings to give you an idea of what is underway and what will be built. We will debut this and dedicate the building. We are on track to have it finished by the centennial Right now, our calendar date looks like to be June the 2nd, a Wednesday, and we will have dedication ceremonies to dedicate Greenwood Rising. We'll go through some of the exhibits and what you will expect to see when you travel to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'm sure all of you are, uh, soon after this call, are, are uh, checking to see what your uh, American Airlines and, and Delta miles, and if you've got them racked up and ready to visit Tulsa at some time the next six months or the year, and this is what you will see when you get here. The first exhibit is the Greenwood Spirit. It talks about the history. How did Greenwood come about? How did Black people even get to Oklahoma? How did this become a Mecca of Black citizens and Black towns? So we go through that. We talk about that. I'd like to show this map from the Oklahoma Historical Society. Uh, and by the 1880s, you will see here of all the number of black towns, historic black towns that were in Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Territory at that time. By the 1940s, there were over 50 historic all black towns. And when we say all black, what we're saying is all the land, all the homes, all the businesses from the grocery stores to the banks, uh, to the haberdasheries, everything was black. You have to understand Oklahoma was a well known for a sundown town community, sundown towns, are towns where if you are a black citizen, it was illegal for you to be in that town when the sun, by the time the sun went down. This was a very segregated and very racially divisive state. And so these black communities uh, thrived and prospered by their insular economies. And you can see how many of there, there were uh, that began in 1865 and again, all the way to the 1840s. Some people who come to Greenwood have no idea how large Greenwood was. There were about 10 to 12,000 African-Americans living in Greenwood at the time of the massacre. And you can see here, I'm actually seated. You look at my cursor. This is really the, what's called deep Greenwood and the historic Greenwood businesses. Right here on this corner is where we're building Greenwood Rising. Um, and I'm sitting actually across the street and get to look out on the construction each and every day. This was the massive area that was known as Greenwood. Um, 33 to 35 city blocks of African-American homes, businesses, um, 
community, neighborhoods, all called Greenwood. Inside the first portion of the exhibit, you will see people displayed uh, honoring uh, some of the pioneers of Greenwood. In front of you there is Ellis Walker Woods, E.W. Woods. He is the first principal of the all colored school at that time, Booker T. Washington High School. His story, he walked over 600 miles from Nashville, Tennessee to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, to actually become and answer the call to be the first principal of Booker T. Washington High School. Um, some of the other things that we'll display in this um, area, it will also be, um, you can see there, the students uh, that you see on your screen. We plan to have a very robust educational program for students, not only from Tulsa and surrounding areas, but even from all Oklahoma to come and have field trips so they can learn. So it will be a highly educational experience. They wanna they'll learn about the Trail of Tears and the freedmen. Um, be able to find out that through the five civilized tribes that relocated during the Indian Removal Act of 1834, and that these five civilized tribes brought their slaves of African descent with them on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma and Arkansas. Yes, another wrinkle in your brain. Some people may be saying, I did not know that Indians owned slaves. Yes, the second largest holder of slaves in the South were the five civilized tribes. We talk about that history. We talk about black boosterism, these towns, how they all had their own newspaper and they would send out narratives and newspapers all across the country after 1865, literally saying, escape the harsh realities of the South, move to Oklahoma, we own land, we own property here. We can live a life free from persecution moved to Oklahoma. And so there were actually boosterism programs that told African-Americans to come to Oklahoma and live and prosper. Um, and, and you can see other areas of there that we will use as a very educational aspect of the spirit of Greenwood. Moving on, we um, have a feature that we're really excited to talk about. Anyone that knows anything about black culture and uh, the history of black communities, they receive their uh, communication, their politics, their um, social times and moments in two places, the Black church and the Black barbershop or salon. And so we will feature a hologram Black barbershop experience to tell the history and story of a community. Uh, Local Projects, which is a expert museum design studio based out of New York City, is our client. They helped us design this. They are known for their work with designing the 9-11 Museum in New York City. They also did a lot of work with Brian Stevenson in Montgomery, Alabama for the development of the Legacy Museum there, as well as many other projects. But they are developing this aspect we're really excited about. Imagine holograms that will be speaking and talking to you with the banter and the spirit that you will find in a Black barbershop to talk about the history. It will be interactive and technologically advanced so that if a young person sits in the barber chair, that hologram will turn, act as if it's cutting the person's hair. And in this example, say something like, young man, never forget where you come from and who you are. We're really excited about this. This will be the only museum in existence in the world where you will be able to experience a hologram barbershop experience of telling the history of a community. So again, get your flights ready and come to Tulsa because this is the only place you'll be able to experience an exhibit like that. We're gonna talk about the timeline and things that led to the animosity. What was the racial environment that began very early on that led up to an incident like 1921 happening? And we talk about that and show that this was a progression of building racial animosity that began in the 1880s, that went through the 1900s, that went and led to Tulsa becoming this uh, powder keg, if you will, of racial animosity that only needed a striking of the match for it to be lit. And that striking of the match took place May 30th, 1921, the elevator incident between a 19-year-old 
black boy, shoeshine boy named Dick Rowland and a 17 year old elevator, <clears throat> excuse me, elevator operator, a white girl by the name of Sarah Page. Dick Rowland went to the Drexler building because it was the only place that had restrooms for black citizens called colored restrooms. He went to the third floor, used the restroom. When he got back to the elevator, the elevator shifted, something happened, but he lost his step. He reaches out to grab her arm to keep from falling. And when he does, she screams. The elevator rests on the bottom floor. The door is open and he runs. Um, later that evening, this article was published in the Tulsa Tribune, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. This article has been cited by many historians as the reason the, or the what was the striking of the match. If you were a Tulsa white citizen and you were a person of the Ku Klux Klan, if you had this racial animosity towards this prospering black community, all you needed was a reason. And this gave them the reason. Um, here in the third paragraph, you'll see here where they wrote, a few minutes later, he entered the elevator, she claimed and attacked her, scratching her hands and face, tearing her clothes and her screams brought a clerk from Renberg's store. I'll go to the bottom paragraph. Tenants of the Drexler building said, the girl is an orphan who works as an elevator operator to pay her way through business college. You'll need to know that those two paragraphs were not true. Tulsa Tribune, along with many papers at that time, operated in a practice called yellow journalism. And I encourage you to look that up. What is yellow journalism? Papers actually competed to see who can tell the most salacious story to sell papers. When they tried to press charges after the incident of 1921, she would not uh, affirm what was written in this paper because it wasn't true. He did not scratch her. He did not try to. Basically, this paper puts in people's minds, the reader's mind, that this black boy tried to rape an innocent white girl on an elevator downtown Tulsa in broad daylight. Uh, even the bottom paragraph where it says she's an orphan and working her way to play through business school. She was not an orphan. She actually lived with her parents. She was not going to business school. All of that was done to create this narrative. And that narrative led to, as it says here, the first shots being fired 10:30 p.m. downtown Tulsa, as one observer read or one observer said, at that moment all hell broke loose, and for the next 16 to 18 hours, one uh, about a thousand to 1,500 members of a white mob, who were deputized by the Tulsa Police Department, given guns, given ammunition, about 1:30 in the morning, marched into Greenwood and began destroying and destruction of the which we have not seen since then. Um, as you can see by the destruction, you can see how structures are burned from the roof down. That gives uh, actually a confirmation to the kerosene bombs that were being dropped on these businesses and they were burning from rooftops down and utterly destroying and wiping out a community. So let's move forward here and talk about the resurgence, the, the rebuilding. Um, this community rallied itself um, they were able to remarkably, that spirit of resilience, without being able to make any claims for insurance, their, their insurance claims, business claims, life insurance claims were not honored because this was labeled, a, quote, a Negro uprising, an actual riot. And so they were not able to make those claims, which actually speaks to how much black wealth was here, that these black communities and calls from around the country sent and pulled their money and sent to Greenwood so they can rebuild. By 1926, five years later, 80 to 90% of Greenwood was rebuilt, which is remarkable even in today's standards. The actual economic activity saw its apex in the mid 1940s. By 1943 is when you actually hear about and read about over 200 black businesses, over 1200 black owned homes, over three hospitals, seven grocery stores, and the list goes on and on. All of that after 1921, which basically these citizens said, we will not be moved, we will rebuild, and they built it bigger and better than it was in 1921. Again, that remarkable story of resilience. So then we talk about the decline. What happened? What happened to Greenwood? Three things caused the second downfall of Greenwood. Number one being the building of the I-244 program called Urban Renewal, which took place all across the United States. Black citizens, call this, nickname it urban removal. 
because of the number of black homes, these highways always, interestingly enough, found their way being built through communities of color all over the United States. And that happened here in Greenwood. I-244 Expressway in the 1960s uh, went right through the heart of Greenwood. Imagine all of the homes and businesses that were uprooted because of eminent domain. That was the number one destruction. Number two was the onslaught of integration and how it impacted this insular African-American economy. And then as people grew and went to college and went and became successful, um, these mom and pop ownership stores uh, did not have anyone to pass their businesses down to. And so in the 70s and especially in the 80s, as these mom and pop businesses died out, their businesses died out with them. So that brings us to the final chamber, which is the journey to reconciliation. That's what this is all about. As you go through this history, there will actually be the final stop would be an amphitheater style space utilized in a classroom style that will be a safe space for people to come and talk about this difficult subject called race. How do we get past where we are? What can we learn from the examples and from these horrific examples of the past um, and where we are today, even a hundred years later? The number of programs that we would have hosted right here in Greenwood Rising if it was open today, if you can imagine the programs we would have hosted, for example, um, programs that we would, would have had community collaborative programs to talk about the aftermath of a George Floyd, to talk about the shooting of an Ahmaud Arbery, to talk about even a community like Tulsa still trying to heal from a Terrence Crutcher shooting, a place where we can have a safe space where black citizens, white citizens, rich, poor, young and old can have this place to talk about where do we go from here? How do we change the way people look at the other person that grew up or have different cultural experiences and have helped to have an understanding and a respect for us to get on this journey to reconciliation for a greater future? And that is um, one of the most proud parts of Greenwood Rising that we are excited to launch and share with the world. We're also building a pathway to hope, and that is a walking path that will go from historic Greenwood over to Elgin, and this will be a symbol of rejoining the district that was destroyed and divided by the I-244 program. And we're in conjunction with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation to have that ready to debut this spring ahead of the debut of Greenwood Rising. If you want any more information on this, we um, encourage you to go to our website, Tulsa2021.org, Tulsa2021.org, and you'll learn all the history you can see pictures, you can see the history of all the work we've been doing over the last five years, and you can also make a donation. Uh, we are still on a $30 million fundraising program. Believe it or not, in the last almost two years, we've raised almost $28 million. We're about a million dollars short, and we want anyone from whether it's $50 or a million dollars, as we have received from so many foundations and corporations, to uh, donate. Inside Greenwood Rising will be this larger than life donor wall. And anyone that has given a donation, we want the community, to, we want everyone to see that the community came together and supported the building of this program. Um, not so much to see your name on the wall, but so that people can come, your grandchildren, your, your, your children and people from years from now can come and see all the names of the people that said, I wanna be on the right side of history and I wanna support this. And so we encourage you uh, and encourage everyone uh, to go and make a donation from our uh, website and be included on this journey to reconciliation with Greenman Rising. That is my presentation. I hope it's given you enough. I believe there may be some questions in the chat that uh, Marion may read to me and maybe I can respond. And uh, you can also send uh, an email if you have any questions or any responses of, uh, to uh, our website. And email address is contact at Tulsa2021.org. Again, that's contact or info at Tulsa2021.org, and thank you. Wonderful, Wonderful presentation. presentation. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions, and if you have any more, please type them while I'm uh, reading the ones that we already have. First one we have is, how can we read the document from teaching the 1997 commission? Excellent question. Um, if you actually go into the, the wonderful world of Google <laughs> and you type in, Tulsa Race Riot Commission, 1997. Any of those combination of words, 1997, Tulsa Race Riot, 
commission, 1997, any of, any of those combination of words, you, it will bring you to, and because it is public record and it's housed at the Oklahoma Historical Society and you can actually read it online, download it and have your own copy and read through that. I encourage everyone to read through it. Okay, say it one more time, please, because I'm tired. Any combination of words, Tulsa race riot, 1997, Commission, 1997, Tulsa race riot, any okay. combination of those words and it'll bring you to that document. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that a history center is also central to the Watchmen series. Did the commission have any contact with the TV production? So after um, the debut, it was obvious um, the first episode and, and then the third episode talked about a museum, interesting enough, we began to say, okay, there is too many similarities here, what's going on? Uh, so yes, we, we got in contact with them. The executive producer is Damon Lindelof. He's actually become a quite good friend of mine. We, we, we dialogue back and forth in the HBO studios. To their credit, they actually, and Tulsa, they have to know, one of the actors featured is Tim Blake Nelson, if you remember him, he's one of the uh, the main characters from Old Brother Where Art Thou, but he is a Tulsa native. And so he arranged for the crew to come and visit Tulsa. I believe it was in the early parts of 2018. And they spent three or four days here. To their credit, they didn't say HBO was here, we're in town. No one really knew they were here. Uh, and they toured Greenwood. They went to Greenwood Cultural Center. They went to the John Hope Franklin Park. Um, they got information. So they, and they sat in from what we understand on some of the commission's meetings uh, and they went back and told the story. Uh, and that's the accuracy of what they get, did in the opening dialogue. Uh, so yes, they, they, they did a little reconnaissance of their own. And since the debut, we've actually maintained a really strong relationship with HBO and Damon and the Law. It's really interesting. I learned several things during your presentation. Here's another one. As of Tulsa, born in 1945, so excited about Greenwood rising and upcoming 2021 events. Hope to get info on volunteer opportunities to assist visitors and locals in understanding. I love that. Um, you can actually, again, go to Tulsa2021.org. There is a page, I think it's called About Us, and you'll learn, read up on Senator Matthews, myself, the members of the commission. At the bottom of that, scroll to the bottom, and it says to sign up for our newsletter, which I encourage you to do that. We have a monthly newsletter that we send out but it also says sign up to be a volunteer. Uh, it also has, we have about six committees and it is open to anyone to join those committees and receive the information and, and the meetings that they have. But volunteer opportunities, yes, we are going to need a very robust volunteer program uh, for to train those to be docents, uh, to lead people through Greenwood Rising. Our first six months uh, of opening, we expect uh, right now, basing our numbers off of other museums that we have been in contact with, uh, mainly uh, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery and, and, and their folks have been very helpful. They saw 600,000 people come through uh, in their first year of opening. Now, there wasn't a pandemic going on then, uh, <laughs> but we're expecting anywhere from 75,000 to 100,000, 150,000 people just in the first year of uh, Greenwood Rising being open. And I'm gonna need a lot of people uh, to take, uh, uh, to take uh, people through. So please go and sign up as a volunteer. Um, we're gonna probably around April, we'll probably have a citywide call and, and maybe utilize Greenwood Cultural Center as a, as a place to uh, train those and have the scripts and everything available so that we can have trained people ready to go as people wanna to come to Tulsa and go through the museum. And you would like people of all races? Of course, Question mark. <laughs> uh, of, of course, uh, this is not, this is not, to, um, and, I, and I like that question um, oh, to clarify. Here, you just froze. That, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, okay. You can hear me. So, um, so I like that question because we want people to know this is not, this did not just happen to uh, Black people. Um, this did not just impact black citizens. This impacted white citizens of Tulsa um, because it became a mark of shame. It became a mark of, we don't wanna talk about this. Let's just sweep this under the rug. That's why we're here hundred years later and people just now finding out about this history. Um, and so 
there has been this cover up. There has been this Tulsa's dirty little secret for so many years because no one wanted to talk about this. So yes, in order to be on this journey to reconciliation, we want and desire citizens from all aspects of life, black, white, young, old, Republican, Democrat, uh, we need to all be sitting at the table. So it would be a joy to have those in their 60s and 70s, white and black, that says, I lived here and uh, I grew up here and never knew this story. That would add so much context to the. And then we want young people, 17, 18, 20 year olds that we're passing the torch to to the future. We want a very a, a myriad of volunteer people. And also the people that are um, are good with sign language, those that you know, we're going to have mm. this open to Oklahoma students for the blind. We want to be able to have to, to the, anybody, any walk of life, wherever they are, whatever their station is in life to say, I want to come through here and I need these special services. So we're going to need those type of, of, of lending helps. Wonderful. I'm one of those who grew up here and, you know, uh, I'm, and I know that this has already been asked. How do we arrange an advance to visit the museum? Will tickets or reservations be required? Yes, we're going to base this off of what we've seen successful with the African American Museum in, in DC and then again, Lagos Museum. There will be a website. Uh, of course, we don't have that up yet, but there will be a website. There will be a date that it will launch and getting tickets, signing up for times will all be electronic. We'll all be able to, you know, your time to visit the, the, the museum will be at 210 on Wednesday <laughs> and show up this space, this time to go through. So, you know, we're gonna have the time out and space out, especially with the pandemic and post pandemic, a lot of changes to how we space things in, in, in the History Center and how you bring groups through. The pandemic has really caused a lot of people to step back and reevaluate how you bring groups through a, 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 you know, a small space. So all of that will gonna be governed by uh, uh, access to a website. Wonderful. Another question, what projects did you look at specifically in Mobile to help with the Greenwood Rising planning? Love that question. So we had about 35 representatives of the commission and community partners. Um, uh, and we took a trip to Montgomery in early May of 2019. We went to the, the, um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, also nicknamed the Lynching Museum. Uh, I would put this on your um, bucket list. Do not um, go to glory uh, without going to see the lynching museum in Montgomery. It is absolutely gripping and powerful. Second thing, go to the Legacy Museum. The New Legacy Museum is the history of African Americans from slavery to mass incarceration. That's where we got a lot of our ideas. It was just phenomenal the way that museum was laid out. And we said, who designed this? And they said, local projects. And we knew then we've got to talk to local projects because we want to do something like this in Tulsa. We went to the Rosa Parks Museum. We went to the Dexter King Avenue Baptist Church, Martin Luther King's um, first pastorate. Uh, we went to his parsonage. There were about four or five places there uh, where we actually took two days to visit and pulled the best ideas from all and came back and had a planning meeting and met with the community and put all that together to get to where we are with Raymond Rising. Fantastic. Okay. And that question about uh, will this Zoom meeting be recorded? Yes, this Zoom meeting has been recorded or is being recorded and it will be available on the Tulsa Library YouTube page. And I searched the other day, Tulsa Library Travels, and they came up, the two that we've already had. So this one will be available soon too. Does anyone have any other questions real quickly? Oh, somebody posted that there's also a copy of the 1997 um, mission at the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. So that's interesting to know. Well, thank you so much, Phil. This was just fascinating. Oh, I had a question. What is the significance of the railroad tracks going through the museum? That's excellent, excellent, excellent. I love, love you guys are just awesome. I mean, I, I, the details in these questions are just absolutely great. So anyone who knows African-American history and the history of segregated communities in the South. Um, when I was growing up, my grandfather was from uh, Hazelhurst, Mississippi. 
um, the, 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 the fierce separation of, of, of black community and white communities there in, in Mississippi in general, but Hazelhurst, uh, my grandfather is half Mississippi Choctaw and half black. Um, and he was able, he told me many times, the only reason he was able to get a public school education is because his, he and his sisters were light enough, skin color light enough to show a blue vein. If you go to school, if you could, if you were a black citizen and you could show a blue vein, and what's the, the meaning behind that is that you were fair enough skinned that education may benefit you uh, later on in life. So if you were darker, then there was no need to waste education on you. They just sent you straight to the, the fields. Uh, and that is a true story. Uh, that's my grandfather. Uh, but in black communities, when you went across the railroad tracks, you were on the black side of town the poor mm. side of town. Um, and that was the same here in Tulsa. Greenwood's community was on the north side of the tracks. When you crossed over the Frisco Railway tracks, everything north was the black community. And so an homage to that history, homage to that time, the first thing you do when you step in Greenwood Rising in the first exhibit, you have to walk over railroad tracks. That, that, that representation of walking into the black community of what was Greenwood. Wow. Very good. And somebody else has said, thanks to everyone involved in the 2021 Centennial events for all the wonderful outreach being made available. I really do appreciate it. I, as a native Tolson, this is an ex 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 exceptional learning experience. Just all of this time, you know, this, these months leading up to uh, May and, and the 1st of June, and I really appreciate you being willing to share with us and with the city and with the country. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much. I, I do believe that, uh, as it's been said many times, Greenwood Rising is needed now in our country more than ever. Uh, it's going to be interesting that I believe Greenwood Rising will be that uh, it's going to be a place of healing, healing from racial history, tra historical trauma, as they call it. Uh, but imagine of all the places that people will come to, they will come to Oklahoma uh, to experience this type of history and go away changed, go back to their communities and have a different perspective on race relations. Uh, it's, it's a powerful opportunity for Tulsa, for Greenwood, for its descendants, for those who lost their lives, we'll be able to say they did not lose their lives in vain. That will be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you to all of you who are present and listening.